Hello there, very warm welcome to our special end of year edition of Talking Europe on France 24. What a year it has been for Europe. You join us here at the European Parliament in Strasbourg with two very special guests to give us their highlights and perhaps some lowlights as well from 2017. I'm very pleased to welcome uh, from the UK, Charles Tannock, a Conservative uh, MEP. Thanks for being Hello, with us. Hello, Catherine. And Elmar Brock uh, from Germany with Angela Merkel's uh, CDU party and uh, here in Europe representing the European People's Party. Thanks very much for being with Thank us. Thank you for the invitation. Well, first then, first question to each of you, uh, just very briefly, what will you remember 2017 for, Charles Tannock? Well, it's been a depressing and sad year for somebody like me who was a conservative pro-European. Article 50 was triggered, so the two-year clock started ticking. Um, and, of course, it was a memorable year because it was the year in which the Eurozone overtook the United Kingdom. It was the year in which David Cameron should have held the referendum. Uh, rather than the previous year. It's the year in which there was a deal done to stem the uh, migrant flows across the Mediterranean between Turkey uh, and, and Greece and Italy, led by Chancellor Merkel. So, in many ways, it's a sad year to reflect on because it could have been so different had it been done some in a different way. And for you, Elmar Brock, what will you remember from 2017? For sure is that uh, Article 50 letter, one of the main problems, the most... Uh, uh, difficult one, but on the other side we see all just good news. Uh, we went forward with our defense uh, union, which is an incredible step forward. Mm -hmm. We have done in the last 12 months more than the 12 years bef uh, before. And uh, this, I think, will lead Europe much more uh, again in the city, bringing in situation to play a role in this world, which is needed if uh, we see in our neighborhood around. And I believe also that uh, the stabilizing of the Eurozone, the proposals mm -hmm. for reforms done by President Juncker and President Macron and others, the new discussions about that uh, will make us stronger, but also the social pillars on such questions. Mm. And therefore, the European Union has used Brexit uh, for future better developments. All right, so Brexit perhaps characterizing uh, many aspects of uh, European life. But it was a year in which Nigel Farage's promise didn't happen. He <laughs> said he would export Brexit across the whole of the European Union. And in all the elections we've seen from France to Austria, Holland, etc., the hardline Eurosceptics did not prevail. Populism has been kept under control. That's also something to think about. Absolutely, that's certainly true. Something we'll, we'll touch on again in a moment. Uh, I'd like to just uh, take a small break from uh, the serious questioning, play a bit of a game with you. I've got some press photos and cartoons from 2017. And I'd like to see if you can remember what these events were. I'm going to hold this one up. This is from February. You can see a large crowd there assembled in the colours of one of the European flags. A clue, please. A clue would be that this happened in one of the newer Eastern European member states. Some protests that were unprecedented. This was protests in Romania. Oh, I can see the Romanian flag oh, now, but it's yeah. blue, it's yellow and red. Yeah. Exactly. And this was uh, the biggest protest uh, against the government in Romania since the fall of communism. All right, I've got another one for you. This one was from the month of May, something many people in Europe were happy about. It was to do with our mobile phones. Oh, this is about the ending of all charges uh, for data. That's right, the end of roaming charges. Roaming charges for data. Within European member states, which means you can go on holiday oh, and you don't have to turn uh, your data off. Yeah, Incredible. absolutely. <laughs> that, that, was, that's, that was one of the tangible benefits that the public can relate to directly. Now, this one, this was actually from November of last year. But the Spiegel retweeted it in the summer. Is that Donald Trump there? It's Donald Trump. And the title says, The End of the, 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 end of the World. world. That's end oh. of the world. <laughs> Do you remember which news item that related to? I wonder if our viewers are thinking about this that as well. That was climate change. Climate change, yes, yeah. with the sun there. That was when he decided to pull out of the Paris, to, to, to pull out of the Paris Agreement. Exactly. Yeah. And one last one before we move on. Uh, this was... About the European victory, I think this was seen as. We've got Europe here holding up a, a tank with uh, some uh, very well-known company names on it. This is about presumably multinationals avoiding their taxes fairly. That's right. This is uh, the EU imposing some uh, historic fines. Fine. Mrs. Vestager. Mrs. Vestager. Mrs. Vestager, yeah. On go, those yes. internet giants. So yes. some... Some moments there to remember from the past year in Europe. Uh, this was a birthday year for the European Union, in a way. We celebrated the 60th anniversary of the Treaty of Rome. 
as you've mentioned, sort of ironically, this was around about the same time that the UK triggered Article 50. Um, a celebratory year then, but with some bitterness. Uh, how much is there to celebrate looking forward for Europe? Charles Tannock. Well, I think uh, it's interesting that Elmar mentioned uh, PESCO. Uh, and it's very curious that even Boris Johnson welcomed, the Foreign Secretary, Foreign Minister of the United Kingdom, welcomed PESCO and said that Britain somehow needs to stay closely involved with uh, European foreign policy, security and defence. Clearly, there'll be so many common threats, be they climate change, be they huge migratory fluxes, be they cyber security, be they problems within NATO, which we've relied on uh, because America's becoming more isolationist. Turkey's been a big challenge. So I think that uh, in terms of uh, Europe, the Eurozone's been growing. PESCO has happened. Macron and Merkel are now talking about serious reforms. I think it's, very, it's really very sad indeed that Britain is, is leaving just as things are happening and moving in the direction that Britain would like. All right. Well, uh, you mentioned Angela Merkel there, of course, such a key figure in the European Union. Uh, she was, as we know, uh, elected Chancellor once again this autumn for a, a fourth successive time. But also in your country, Elmer Brock, uh, we saw the AFD, the Alternative für Deutschland, the far right party, enter Parliament for the first time. And this was news that was uh, widely discussed all around Europe. But we actually have a report for our viewers to remind everybody about the AFD and uh, where their support base came from. This is from Luke Brown, this report. Small towns like Waldheim here in Saxony, a fertile ground for the AFD, the alternative for Deutschland. The party scored 25% here in the state, more than twice the national average. Local candidate Heiko Hessenkemper has a simple message, our Germany comes first. I can only spend one euro once, so I either give it to social welfare and refugees, and the majority of them will never enter the labor market, but they'll profit from our social system indefinitely. Or I can spend this same money on kindergartens and schools. Here, that Germany first slogan is striking a chord. Last year, the German state spent over 9 billion euros dealing with the influx of migrants. Over 200 of those beneficiaries are lodged in this center near Leipzig. Each adult receives 320 euros a month. Nadi Hula Faisi is Afghan. He and his family arrived in 2015. But despite Germany's official welcome, he knows many locals resent his presence. I don't feel great here in Saxony. Perhaps there are some Nazis who don't want foreigners to live here. But we have no other choice but to live here. People like Nadi Hula and his family are not the only targets of the AFD. It started out an anti-European party just four years ago. For its MEP Beatrix von Storch, proposing an alternative to mainstream policies is a vote winner. Migration and Islam is one. European Union and the Euro is another one. We were founded on the grounds of the, uh, the Euro and now we are focusing of course of, on migration and Islam because this is what the people's interest is. The AFD's rise does not come without resistance. Gisela's grandparents were imprisoned by the Nazi regime. Now she's worried that the far right is returning to the national parliament, the Bundestag. We already had the Nazis take us over once. They're coming back now. That's why I have to resist. They think they are an alternative, but in reality, they're not proposing any alternative. So there we go, a reminder of uh, the Alternative of your Deutschland party entering the German parliament in the autumn uh, for the first time. Uh, Elmar Brock from Angela Merkel's party yourself. How big a threat do you see these uh, relatively small but very vocal parties such as the AFD? They're, they're nationalists, they tend to be anti-European. A, a threat to Europe at this point? It's a threat for Europe but also a threat for the member states. Is it first of all the situation in member states? And uh, here we have to give the proper answers to that, not to follow them, not to follow the old line uh, of nationalism, which has brought us in Europe in the last centuries in such difficult situations. And uh, I think more and more the people rely, realize it. People go to the streets for Europe, now what not happened in the uh, years before. Uh, and therefore I'm quite optimistic that this will be stay in minority. In Germany, it's for the first time in the national parliament. Uh, but uh, it has less than half of the votes uh, Mrs. Le Pen becomes in France. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not better because of that, and therefore we will take it seriously. And we have the good situation in Germany that none of our democratic partners uh, wants to 
do a coalition with them, they are totally outlaws in that sense. They certainly are. Charles Tannock, uh, what's your take on, uh, on this issue? And it's not just uh, nationalists who are anti-European uh, in, in the sense of the AFD. Uh, we also have things like uh, the, the separatist issue in Catalonia, these much smaller parties that are really getting all the headlines. Well, I think it's, it's good news for the European Union generally because, as I said, uh, Nigel Farage's promise to export Brexit and see the collapse of the whole European Union hasn't come to pass. In fact, the Eurobarometer surveys have shown the EU is actually at a high in terms of popularity. Uh, and, of course, there has been a little bit of shift also in Britain. I think a lot of people have begun to understand after the referendum the amount of good things that the EU does in terms of consumer protection, in terms of uh, things like, you know, regulating and taxing multinationals, uh, fighting tax evasion, climate change, uh, the environment, and so on and so on. A lot of the thing, things were, weren't appreciated fully uh, during the campaign, sadly, and, uh, and now we are seeing the consequences. So I think, actually, the message of Brexit actually spread across Europe. So even Ma Madame Le Pen has toned down her anti-European rhetoric Mm. having lost the pre French presidential election. And we saw similar trends in Austria, in Holland, to, to a certain extent in Italy amongst the Five Star Movement and the, the, the Northern League. All of them have toned down the European rhetoric because they know at the end of the day the EU can be an easy punch bag. It can easily be criticised for everything. Mm. But at the end of the day, it has faults. Mm. But it's still a peace and prosperity project. And a lot of people now see Brexit as a very selfish act, frankly. So uh, this seems like a good moment to move on to talking uh, specifically about France. We've mentioned Marine Le Pen. Uh, she was, of course, beaten rather soundly in the second round of the French presidential election that we were all so obsessed with in the spring of this year uh, by Emmanuel Macron. Now, he is Mr. Europe. That's uh, how he wants to show himself anyway, isn't it? He wears his love for the EU so firmly on his sleeve. He really wants to lead Europe. He's got lots of ideas for Europe. Is he a positive influence on Europe or is he trying I to tinker a bit too much? He's a very positive uh, man for Europe. He has visions. He wants to go forward. He has also done the internal reforms of France to make France competitive again which was very much needed both for the development of the euro as for the credibility of France. And therefore, we Germans are very happy to have a strong pro-European French president uh, back uh, so uh, mm -hmm. that we had not to lead alone anymore, as it was <laughs> in the past. So it was not very comfortable. And I believe that his proposals will move at forward. So we will not accept everything in every detail of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the direction is in order, and uh, uh, therefore... Uh, in Germany, he got in his first year the Charlemagne Prize of uh, Aachen, and uh, this, mm -hmm. I think, is a sign how we see him in Germany. Okay, that's a positive view then from Germany. Some people in France, Charles Tannock, viewing Macron with a little bit more suspicion. He paints himself as an outsider, but he's very much an insider in so many ways. What's your take? Well, I have to say, I have a very favourable attitude towards President Macron. I was, you know, I heaved a huge sigh of relief when he decisively beat uh, uh, Madame Le Pen in the presidential elections in France. Uh, I mean, you know, everybody's going to have some uh, flaws from time to time, but he is a young man with a, an ambitious reform project for Europe. Uh, clearly, he wants to make the case for multilateralism, for, for supranational governance, for international cooperation. Clearly, he wants to also look at the whole Elysee Treaty between France and Germany. Mm -hmm. Because Germany is a little bit weakened now because of the lack of a, a government in place, he's clearly taking on that responsibility uh, as the kind of motor between the French and the Germans. They are the most powerful economies. And with Brexit happening, Britain leaving, mm. those two countries become even more key. I'm hoping that a big country like Italy might also uh, step in to, fu to, to, fu to, to fill the vacuum left mm -hmm. by... And one Brit day even Poland. And, Brit and Poland, Br the Britain departing. But at the moment, the two uh, old founder members with, with real clout still, uh, particularly France as a, as a nuclear power, as a serious military power, and the size of the German economy, these two countries must take a leadership role, and I think Macron is trying to do that. Well, there we go. Well, just got time then, I think, to show one last cartoon. Not really a quiz, this one. More just one of our favourite cartoons from 2017. Uh, those are the two people I, I think I was talking about. That's, is that Madame Merkel and Monsieur Macron dancing some kind of uh, ice skating? Yes, exactly. <laughs> Slipping a little bit as the uh, coalition talks faltered and Jean-Claude Juncker looking on 
with uh, concern from the side. But uh, yes, yeah, still dancing together on that slightly slippery ice. Well, so many things we haven't been able to talk about. The, the Paradise Papers revelations, uh, more from Brexit, the unprecedented homage that we saw here in Strasbourg to Helmut Kohl in the summer. Uh, and perhaps... Uh, you know, looking forward into 2018, uh, of course, Catalonia still very much on people's minds. But I'd like to thank you both very much for participating in this look back on 2017 and wish you the very best for 2018. Elmar Brock and Charles Tannock, MEP. Thank, thank you, you Catherine. So much. A happy new year to you too. And, uh,